Hello everyone, welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, October 1st. Today's topic is Innovate with iPad. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffat, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning, and thanks to Patty Ruffing for doing a new Collaborate intro for us, as well as sending out the certificates when you complete the surveys. Our special guests today for Innovate with iPad are Karen Lehrman and Kristen Wydeen. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will int introduce our two guests. Well, hello, everyone. We are very excited to have two special guests today to share their passion for the power of iPads for learning. They are two, if you know them, you're going to know this is true, they are two very high energy, enthusiastic primary teachers who are always creating learning opportunities for their students that inspire deeper learning and understanding while still making it fun and engaging for them. And even more, they always find time to share and collaborate with other educators to help all of us learn from their experiences. So even though they're primary teachers, if you don't happen to teach primary, I know you'll be able to take away many great apps and ideas that will work in any grade level. Karen is an award-winning primary school teacher who is transforming education by connecting her students with the world through Twitter, blogs, and video conferencing. She takes a very hands-on approach to teaching by including inquiry, projects, and the maker mindset in her classroom. Her students get to choose how they learn, show, and share their knowledge. Karen earned her Bachelor of Arts degree and Bachelor of Education degree and a diploma in teaching English as a second language from the University of British Columbia. And she's taught in both Australia and Canada. She's also an Apple Distinguished Educator and a Google for Education Certified Innovator. Kristen has spent her career teaching and engaging primary school children in the United States and Canada. Through her innovative, student-driven projects, she teaches classes to take chances and to develop those skills necessary to succeed in the 21st century. She is always encouraging her students to create, collaborate, and to be open to trying new things in her classroom every day. She earned her bachelor's degree in education through the University of Windsor, completed her education, completed her master's in the art of teaching at Mary Grove College in Detroit, Michigan, and was recognized as an Apple Distinguished Educator. And she frequently blogs, as do both of them, about their educational journey. And they love inspiring educators to use technology in innovative ways. So we want to give a big welcome to Karen and Kristen. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. And we're going to ask you our newbie question, just to prime the pump a little bit, and then have you take over with your presentation. And we'd like you to give us a quick explanation about what is the difference between using an iPad and using an iPad for learning. Take it away. Hi, everybody. This is Kristen. I'm so excited to be here today. Um, using an iPad, I, I feel that we, I use my iPad to check my email, uh, look at Facebook, um, read articles online, and um, it's a lot different than using an iPad for learning. So the trend in the past few years of iPad usage in education, it's quickly moving towards using the iPad as a creation device. So that means making students thinking visible through whiteboard apps, creating videos, and recording their voices, as opposed to just a consumption device. More and more people are creating great material with their iPads, even little ones. And so many teachers want more for their students than apps and programs. We need to advocate for using iPads to introduce 
students to new ideas, opportunities, and people. Karen, do you want to add? Sure, Kristen. And I'm Karen. And it's a pleasure to be here, both here and with my co-author, Kristen. Um, our goal as teachers with iPad is to rely less on content-specific apps and to teach our students to be self-directed learners. Students can use iPads to show what they know, represent their thinking, create something, and teach and learn from others. As teachers, we need to further our knowledge in using creation apps to make valuable lessons for and with our students. Which really nicely sets us into our presentation, so I'm just going to adjust to the next slide. And for both Kristen and I, it all started with just one little iPad. We were both fortunate to be giving an, given an iPad. And at the time, we really had no idea what to do with it. And so quickly, we combed the App Store, and we found um, join practice type apps and stories we could read, and we got it into the hands of our kids. And they loved it. I mean, they thought it was great that they could get high scores and that um, even though there was one, they could share it and work together, and it was awesome. But we realized there was way more to an iPad um, than being able to consume on it. And, and as the newbie question says, what was the difference? Um, and we wanted our students to be able to create content and actually show what, what they know. And so we, we both kind of went on a bit of a journey moving away from those drill and practice type apps because really, um, in terms of the center model, they're just on the substitution level where instead of doing a worksheet with math questions, they were now just tapping an iPad. Um, and yeah, they got war prizes and you know things would light up, but really the teaching and learning hadn't changed a whole lot. Um, and so we moved on to one, so we moved on from there. And we're going to let Kristen continue here. So we want to start with um, showing you this image of a student's work. And so this student was asked to write down the numbers, the number 13 in multiple ways. Looking at this piece of work, it's difficult to assess because there's many parts that are hard to read. In fact, this piece of work was graded as not meeting expectations. Convinced that this was not a true reflection of what the student knew, I, I had the student record their voice and explain his work using an iPad and the app Show and Tell. Take a look at the video he produced. So we need to play this video. It is coming. I'm so sorry, but I'm having a problem entering that URL in the web tour. Lori, could, I could you do that? I got it. I got it. Oh, good, because I'm not seeing it. Thank you. Whoops, we got this back. Hold on a second. There we go. Um, if you could just put in the chat section if you have watched the video.
Great. I see lots of people are just finishing up. Okay, so I wanted to share this because this is really a clear example of how having a student record their voice and explain their thinking makes such a difference. He was being assessed on his penmanship in the image, and with the recording, he can be assessed on his knowledge of the content, which is so much more than what we saw in just the image. One of the first tasks of receiving iPads is to figure out what apps you want and will need on your classroom iPad, which is such a daunting task. You must navigate over 80,000 apps curated for education in the App Store. So Karen and I are going to try and make that a little bit easier for you by showing you um, some, of the, some of our favorites. Awesome. Um, yeah, so we kind of highlight five different apps in our book, and we find that with these five apps, we're able to hit pretty much any type of content. Um, obviously, there's many other apps you can add to your list, but I'll just kind of go through the, the five that are here on the screen. The first one is Poplet, and Poplet is a mind mapping app. It is absolutely free. Um, there's, I shouldn't say there's a, there's a free version, and then if you're on shared devices, there's actually a paid version where you can save your Poplets. But what it allows you to do is make simple mind maps. You can put in um, images, text, drawings, and it's a really neat way to organize your work, which we'll show you. Um, the one in the middle is called Draw and Tell, and this was originally a paid app by Duffet Moose. It's now gone free because they're part of Khan Academy, and it's a fabulous app for your youngest learners, your Ks, your preschoolers, probably K2, K3. Um, it allows you to import images, um, add voice, annotate, but it's in a really simple, just draw your own things, they have stickers that you can use, which we'll show you as well. But it allows you to create your own content um, in a way that is safe for young kids to learn and easy. The tools make sense, the pictures, the icons that are in the app make a lot of sense. Besides that, we have Pic Collage, and Pic Collage is an image, um, a collage making app. But I think at the most basic, we think, oh, we can take pictures and we can make a pretty collage and we can share that. But there's way more things that we can do um, with Pic Collage, which we'll show. Which we'll show. The bottom two, Book Create and Explain Everything, are both paid ads, but well worth the money. And it's interesting how schools are willing to buy, you know, a textbook or a Chromebook, but to pay, you know, the four or five dollars one time for an app that they can use over and over again. Um, it's sort of something you need to advocate for your students. And so, Book Create is a book making app, and it and it's a great also. It's also great to be used as a tool to document learning and to capture images over time and to be able to annotate. And we'll share many ideas on how to use Book Creator. And the last one is Explain Everything. And Explain Everything is sort of the grandfather of the whiteboard screencasting apps. And it's far more than just a whiteboard screencasting app. You can actually do animation. You can do green screen things. You can do a whole a number of things with Explain Everything. And what's nice now about Explain Everything for our younger learners is there is an easier version of it, an easier format. And with that easier format, um, there's not quite as many tools for the kids to get muddled around in. But as your students get older and more comfortable with the app, you can turn on um, the more advanced features, and they're, they're able to do a lot more things with that. So those sort of are our five key ones. And most of the lessons we share in our book are all linked back to those same five apps. So the thing with an iPad is often well, Chris and I will hear, but I've only got one iPad, or I've got a card of iPads. And the thing is, it really doesn't matter whether you have one access to one all the time, or one that you sign out, or you have access to one to one, or a whole class. Many of the lessons that we share in our book and that we're trying to share today can be done um, just as a rotation in the station, or um, you know, the child that needs the iPad for that specific function gets the iPad for that specific function. It's not about just doing um, everybody doing the same thing at the same time. The iPad really is a personalized device. So whatever you have, they're able to, to create um, with however many devices you have. So I always like, we recognize that not everybody has iPads, and that pool just showed us that right in the beginning. Um, and that the, the things that we're sharing really can be done as a station or as a group activity. Um, so that's really important that, um, that you're aware of that. Okay, so the first half that we're going to talk about is Poplet, um, and this we're going to actually we're going to um, 
give you a few examples from each um, for each app. And so we really feel like Popper is like the only mind mapping app your students will ever need because it allows young learners to record facts, research, generate ideas, and to document and organize their learning. So this example here is um, using number pieces. It's also a free app, and you can see that it's uh, they're working on their um, number sense and. So my kids actually, they roll three dice and they make a number with the, those dice. So you can see that the first one was 253. They write it in standard form and then expanded form. Um, and so this is an example of one of the um, activities in our book using Poplet. All right, another example here. Um, this is another math example. And what's nice about this, I mean, we often have people say, oh, your examples in your book are only primary, but the reality is, most of the things we share within the book can be easily adapted. The content can change really easily to make it work for you. So in this case, these are my second grade students. Um, they have to pick a number between 1 and 100, a two-digit number, and they have to, to work on showing that they understand the number, but breaking apart, or, you know, 10 more than that number, 10 less. But really, for any number, you could do this. Um, for any content, you could have different ideas um, coming off of your poplet. It's not specific to um, just this math, this format. I mean, you can think of this graphic organizer as, as just one of many ways you could use Poplet to share content. And what's nice is the kids are creating. I'm not saying everyone must this and everyone must that. The kids are able to show what they know. So those kids that are still, you know, just developing some of their number sense can start with a smaller number, and the ones that feel more confident can work ahead and use a larger number. Um, this example is um, in a grade one classroom. We were working on. Um, rhyming words. So they were able to choose an image and then um, they just very simply uh, made words to rhyme. Um, you could use this as a center with like Dr. Seuss books and they'd pick out a, a word from one of the Dr. Seuss books and they could do it that way as well. The next example is um, from a science example um, and we use Poplet a lot for our inquiry. Um, so this is obviously the life cycle of a frog. Um, however, you could do this with any animal, um, and we love using this and then actually taking this picture and putting it into like book creator, which would be part of their book for their inquiry. In this case, um, this is a social studies example, and we have tried in this presentation to show you examples in different content using the same five key apps, so that's kind of important for us. Um, so this was my students had to come up with ways they could help the world, and so they um, used an image, an image using site, and they found images of different ways that they could help the world. And so they created different, um, they created, I guess, a graphic image of the different ways that they could help the world. And what's nice again is that you can change that content. It can make, you can have it your grade level content. It's not, it doesn't have to be ways to help the world. It can be whatever content you need to use Poplet with. Um, and that's why we do focus on these five key apps. So looking at other ideas of ways to use Poplet. Again, public can be really, you can set up a graphic organizer, or you can show your kids how you want to set up a graphic organizer. They can use it to collect information um, when they're doing animal research. And so my kids have had, like, when they're looking at the research or watching videos, if they hear about an animal, something that it has, they can put a box underneath the has um, title box. They can do can, are, you can connect the boxes, you can unlink the boxes. Um, we've had it where we've compared urban and rural communities, where we've looked for types of nouns, whether it's a person, a place, or a thing, and for brainstorming topics. So that just that key starting brainstorm, put your idea in the middle and have webs coming off. So it's a really good just organizer tool. So if you're starting a writing project and you want to organize your ideas, creating that, that web that you would traditionally on paper, but now you, you can actually do it graphically. You can move stuff around. You can add stuff. And what's nice is when we talk about some of the other apps, when you created this web, you can put it into an app that allows you to add voice, and then you can share your ideas um, even further with voice. Uh, moving on, our second app is Pit Collage, and I wanted to start with this picture in particular because for us in Canada, it's still, we just finished our first month of school. I know in the States, the people are a bit longer in other parts of the world, they've been going on longer. But Pit Collage allows you to search images right within the app. Not only can you search images, but you can take images and upload them into the app, and you can create collages. So this was just a sample. I can get my students to create a collage about themselves and the things that make them happy and the things that show you know, who they are. You can do that for any subject area, though, any animal research, anything like that. The same idea, you can make a collage that supports 
um, the learning that they're doing in the classroom. Uh, this um, image is uh, using pic collage, and we did this in a grade two classroom. The um, standard was that they had to figure out when they were supposed to use centimeters or meters, but this would be a great activity for, um, you could change centimeters to inches um, and feet, and you could also, we've done this with older students that, um, so they have to find in their classroom something that's between, say, 20 centimeters and 40 centimeters, so they have to go around and um, measure things and then take pictures of those, those um, images. You go ahead, Karen. Sorry, there's two of us on here. Um, we apologize. Um, so this one was, again, just another math activity. And as an early years teacher, I do strongly believe in hands-on learning, um, you know, doing, not just being on a device. And so we often use our devices to help document the learning that we've done. And so in this case, my students were trying to show different ways to make the number 10, which is a key concept in early years math. Um, and so they were able to create, and as they would create a number, a way to make 10, they would take a photo of it. So then they then took their photos of it and added it into pic collage where they were able to label um, their number sentences. It was interesting, and I'm not positive if this one or not, but I know I had many examples where the kids, their math was actually incorrect. And so as much as they felt confident and they did all that, it allowed me as their teacher to see where they were getting things right and where they were struggling. And so it was, it was a really, I think this one's actually all correct. Um, but it was really interesting to see, and, and because it's open-ended, you really do get to see what your students are learning, and you get to, to, to know what they know and what they still need um, to learn. Uh, this one is just, again, using that pic collage, the image search, and it, someone in the chat had said, be careful with the image search in pic collage. One of the sites that we use a fair bit in my classroom is called Pixabay. Com and the kids are allowed to use those. So if they have some ideas of things, images that they want, they will go to pictobay.com, they will do their searches, they will save their images to their iPads, and then when they're in pic collage, they're able to upload them. So this was just a simple looking for a sample of a solid, a liquid, and a gas in, in a, science, a science classroom. Okay, a couple other ideas with pic collage. I've done, um, I've had kids open up their lunches and for, um, and they've had to put their, they've had to take pictures of everything in their lunch and then put it into two columns for healthy and not healthy. Um, we've gone around and taken two, uh, pictures of two or 3D shapes. Um, also procedural writing. So they, um, my, the last time I used this for procedural writing, what we did was they picked a sport and so they were in partners and they took pictures of the actions of how to do something. So for example, to kick a soccer ball. And they would take those pictures and then write in what they had to do, uh, the steps for the procedure. Um, also parts of speech, so we've done noun. So they've put personal, person, place, and thing and taken pictures of those things. Um, and then again, capturing the inquiry process. So even if you were doing um, a science experiment, they could take pictures of the science experiment and then go back and, and label and explain what happened afterwards. Awesome. So moving on um, to the app Draw and Tell, and it's really quite funny the story behind Draw and Tell because I discovered it through um, just one of those app review, a parenting app review, and I don't know that it was ever built for education. I think it was actually just built for children at home with their families. And I remember getting finding this app and and you know telling my friends Kristen and Kathy Cassidy, and I said, "This is a really great app. It's called um, Draw and Tell. You've got to see it." And it took a while for them to to bite, but once they bit, I think they were kind of hooked. Um, what's nice about this app is it really is young learner friendly. The tools make total sense. When they were on a record, there's a, a nice little recording button. When they want to draw with a crayon, there's a crayon button and they have their crayon choices. What's nice about Draw and Tell, and this is a math example, is the kids, they also have stickers. And with the stickers, you're able to put in um, various characters. And when you use the recording feature, when you touch the stickers, they will move around the screen. So this is at the most simple level. It's someone, a student choosing a number and, and having the one-to-one -one correspondence showing the pictures to go with that. Um, they could then add their voice and they could talk about, you know, the different ways that they got to make ten, eight. So maybe there's three and three and two, um, the, very, the various things like that. So it's just a really neat, it's just, as a basic, it's just a drawing app. Um, you can add images, you can add pictures, you can add, um, and what, the other thing I wanted to share is that when you use this app, 
when you touch the screen, um, an automatic pointer shows up um, on the screen. They don't have to select any tools for that pointer, and automatically little blue dot shows up on the screen, and they can, you can see what they're talking about. Um, this is another one. So this was a, when my students were using patterns, and there is no video here. There was a video, and I apologize. Um, this is just them creating their own patterns using the stickers. And again, when they record themselves, you can hear them thinking, you can see if they've got that one-to-one -one correspondence or if they're just sort of rattling off um, and don't understand it. And that whole voice piece really allows your students to show what they know and to show their thinking, which is sort of what we want, because we want to know what they're doing, right? OK, for this example, students were to take a picture in their classroom, and then um, they actually drew around, they had to find 2D shapes. So you can see that they, um, they drew around, make, you know, the rectangles and circles and triangles and things, and then they recorded their voice um, naming those shapes. So you could take it a step farther and do um, 2D or 3D shapes. Um, and so this was actually a K1 class, so we, we just did the 2D shapes. Um, also, for this example, um, this is taking a picture of um, like a math station. So they had to show um, a dollar four different ways, and then they recorded their voice. And this is actually a video. So I'm wondering if we can show that right now. I think Peggy says the video is coming. And maybe in the chat if you're able to see the video and you've watched it, if you just let us know. Here is four ways to make a dollar. First one is you can use a one dollar coin, or you can use four quarters, or you can use seven dimes and six nickels, or you can use five nickels and three quarters. That's all correct. So I love how this example shows that you, you know, just just taking a picture of what they've done and then um, explaining, you know, using their voice to explain what they've done is so powerful. All right, so this next example, um, again, there was a video and I apologize, it's not here. This was just a literacy example where my students were watching um, and they watched a video about the, the moon and the sun and day and night. And so they, after the video, I asked them to go into draw and tell and to, to draw what they already knew from the video. Um, so what information, so in this case, um, in her video, it actually said that she, she knew that the sun went around, I mean that the moon, the sun went, the moon went around the sun. Um, well, that the moon spun so that there was day and night, sorry, I'm telling you this up. Um, but she didn't know, so her new information was that she didn't realize that those flowers actually closed at night. And so she was able to share her learning through video, I mean, through image and with voice, and able to share what she knew and didn't know in this simple app called Draw and Tell. Some of the other examples of Draw and Tell, my kids use it quite a bit for self-assessment. So they'll grab a photo of a page in their book, and they'll read it, um, and then, and then um, sorry, they'll, the, the, they don't necessarily self-assess, but they'll read it so that they can record it so they can have it, so then they can write a self-assessment on their reading. Um, they've used it to, to retell the beginning, middle, and end of a story um, and within it. And with Draw and Tell now is you can actually, each page makes its own little movie, and you can connect like three different Draw and Tell so they can actually make a little movie within that with their information. Any work that they've done non-digitally, they grab a photo and they annotate, they can talk about it. Um, and when they do work study, there's some really cool um, rainbow letter, like rainbow tools that they can use to write various words. And they use that to practice their words 
Um, my kids have actually done writing on it so that they can write it and then they can track it and record their, read, their writing um, for other people to say. There's just tons. It comes with blank paper. It comes with interline paper, line paper, and then you can upload your own pictures. So there's tons of different things that you can do with Draw and Tell. Um, moving on, our next app is Book Creator. And everyone always thinks of Book Creator as the app where you write stories. Um, and you can write stories in Book Creator and comics, and it's a lovely, fantastic, wonderful app that allows you to do that. But my students often use it as a place to house a whole bunch of their learning in one place, sort of like a, a journal kind of thing. And so in this case, it's a math activity. And so the entire book was, the answer is four, 44, what is the question? In this case, they use an app called Number Pieces. They could use any math manipulative that they have in the classroom to make their numbers, and then they'd write their number sentence to go with it. And it was interesting to see the children who really just stuck to the tens and ones, and those that were able to, to have you know, harder numbers and harder different ways to make that number. And it was really great just to see their math learning and to understand what they're capable of. And again, it's not me telling them what to do. It's them showing me what they know. Um, something that we do a lot in my class through inquiry is we create um, these fantastic books. So um, I try to have the students at the beginning of the year, we go over nonfiction text features. And um, we continually add to that. So it might be only a couple things that they have to include in their book. By, but by the end of the year, there might be 10 or 12 things that they need to include. So we always try and include a diagram. So um, with Book Creator, it's very simple because they have the arrows and they can add their, um, their text and their pictures. Uh, so this is an example of one. Um, Another example is um, actually Karen had shared this book with me, and it's called um, One is a Snail, Ten is a Crab. And so we made a, um, a class book. So each student would make one page, and they made a math question out of the different animals. So each animal that had different amount of feet, it goes through the book. And so you can see here that they have ten for a crab, one for a snail, and six for an insect. So they add that all together and they draw their picture. And so each student does that. And Book Creator is fantastic because you can, um, you can airdrop all of the pictures onto one iPad and create a class book for it. Um, this example is using the comic uh, book in Book Creator. So there's an option to use comics. And it's, it's fairly new, probably about a year old. Um, and what we did was that we took pictures of different 3D objects, and then they, they used the speech bubbles to tell us what they were. Awesome. There's so many ideas that you can use with Book Creator. Um, I think Christian mentioned and as well with me, when we do inquiry, my kids are often capturing images along the way. And Book Creator is just a really nice place for them to put in their documentation where they can talk about it, um, what, what they know so far and what they're learning so far, and as it goes, um, they have a full collection of that learning process. What's nice too is that Book Creator will not only save as an iBook, but it will also save as a video. And so as I noticed some of you were talking about Seesaw. In my district, we use a portfolio assessment called First Grade. My students can then upload those final videos, and then they can even add more reflections into their digital portfolios or onto their blogs. Um, and we use KidBlog for our blogs. Uh, and my kids are also use Animal Reports. And like Christian had mentioned, you can have different kids working on Book Creator projects on different devices, and you easy, easily can airdrop them to one another. If your internet doesn't allow that, you can set up a Google um, Drive folder, or you can use a Dropbox folder, and the kids can upload their work to the same spot, and then they can, download it, they can be downloaded and combined together on the same iPad. And so it's really neat. You can have kids working independently, but at the same time collaboratively, and they can rearrange the pages and that kind of thing. And so my kids have done that with their animal research projects or animal reports. Um, again, creating the class book, like Kristen had mentioned, you can have different students working on different pages of a book. Um, so maybe um, in Canada, Thanksgiving is coming up. I know it's earlier than it is in the States. Um, and so our students might be able to write a page to things that they're thankful for, and then we can make a book, um, Division 16 is thankful, and we can have everyone's work samples included into there. 
Um, and again, reflection in terms of um, work samples collected over time for self-reflection. My students can use this as a place to put in writing samples. So every month they'll say, okay, boys and girls, grab your favorite writing sample for the month, grab a photo, put it in, and make a voice recording reflection. And that's what's really nice about Book Creator is that you're able to just add voice. And so it allows my, my, less, my developing writers share what they know without having to be flustered by being able to um, have to type everything. So we can go on with iPad and its accessibility features, and everything is possible with iPad. But I'm only slightly biased. Okay, so our last um, app that we're going to talk about is Explain Everything. And my students create many different artifacts, but the most meaningful are those in which students show their learning and their thinking using Explain Everything, I find. When they make a video or screencast of what they've learned, I can hear and see their thinking. In this example, students have used the free app Make a Scene Farmyard, um, and they've created an array and showed the multiplication number sentence as well as recording their voice explaining it. Uh, we don't have the video, but um, it's fantastic to hear how they explain. Um, you know, they go through the three groups of four, they go through the array, they go through the actual um, three times four is 12. And so you can really get a great sense of if they have understanding of that not just um, what three times four is, but the conceptual as well. Um, this next example just, is, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Karen. No, you can do it, you do it. Okay, um, do the it. next example is with um, Explain Everything, and um, it's obviously, it's showing the water cycle. So it's, you can also draw on Explain Everything. You can change the background um, color. You can can add text um, and add different colors to it. Um, and I was just going to add, I had the privilege of sitting next to Rashawn Richards, um, who's one of the co-founders of Explain Everything, and watched him use his app. Um, and he takes it to the whole um, animation. I mean, there's spin tools in there. There's all these things. And so I watched him actually create a bus, put images of people inside the bus, lock everything, then draw a road, have the bus go up the road, over the road, around the corner, and all this kind of thing. And it was all just within Explain Everything. And so, well, my students, I'm not sure they're there yet. Um, it's really cool to see what the potential that app has. Um, again, this is a science example, and this is a, a basic level. And this could be done in a multiple different apps, but this is just using um, an image of a seed growing and being able to document what's happening and being able to document the growth over time and labeling using the tools that are within um, explain everything. What's nice about explain everything again is that that can be, you know, day, maybe this was day 20. We could have day one, day two, day three, or day five, day 10, day 15. Each slide could have a different image and each slide could then show the progression. And so the kids can see that, that change over time and they can see the growth that's happening with the activities they're doing. And they're creating it. I'm not running off sheets. I'm not organizing all that kind of stuff. And they can talk about, oh, I didn't realize this was going to happen. Or, oh, I was surprised that self-assessment piece can go on. Um, that self-reflection piece can go on and be added as, as we're going um, and things that they're curious about. I wonder if this will happen. I wonder if that will happen. All that is still available with Explain Everything. Um, this, this example is with Explain Everything, you can download uh, PDFs into the app. And so this is an actual book that has been downloaded into the app. So you can see at the bottom it says slide four of nine. And what's fantastic about this is that I really, um, I, we, I explicitly teach that, think, that reading is thinking. And so you can see the NL, that stands for new learning. So they can highlight right on the text. Q is question, and they can type in that, the questions that they have. Um, and the little ex, exclamation mark in the star, that means that they think that's really exciting, and they might use that in, um, in a story or in their nonfiction writing. And um, so it's very, their thinking is very visible using the iPad um, downloading um, PDFs and then using Explain Everything to show their, their thinking. All righty. Um, as I said, we can use Explain Everything. It can work in coexistence with a portfolio, or just, it can be a, a math or a writing or a reading portfolio. Um, so we talk about reading fluency. The kids are able to, on one page, like Christian showed, she's got, there she showed them annotating, but they can also send, use that same piece of text and read it 
and then listen to their reading and then make a recording of them talking about their reading. What did they notice they did well? What do they want to get better at? What have they been working on? And as, as you know, and did they notice that they saw those changes? So it's really great to be able to capture. And again, add another slide, add another sample. Do it over a set, a set series of time at the end of the school year or along the way. Upload it to a portfolio where the parents can see that growth over time. Nothing like having a parent say, my child can such and such. And, here, and you're able to say, oh, but take a listen. This is where your children are at. You know, this is what we're hearing in school. Um, so it's great for assessment and, and documentation of learning. Writing self-reflection. So a lot of the times my kids will take a photo. Um, they'll put it in to explain everything. And then within that, they're able to talk about their writing. Again, what did they work hard on? What did they notice that they want to get better at? How are they going to get better at that? What help do they need for me to get there? Getting them involved with their learning and just having a platform or a tool that allows them to be able to do that. Again, we've talked about other platforms that people are using. Anything you make can explain everything. Or in my case, I always say anything that saves to a camera roll, you can upload to that Seesaw portfolio, or you can upload that to your fresh grade, or you can upload that to your blog, or you can email it to a parent. Um, so it, it's really important. Again, annotating works super easy to do and explain everything. At the simple um, version, there's just one pointer that the kids can use, or I think maybe a couple. When you go to the more advanced version of explain everything, which is just a toggle switch within the app, um, there's lightsaber pointers and all types of pointers which seem to attract kids quite a bit. Um, adding voice to a screenshot from any other app. Now you'll notice it, when we talk about these apps is that thing, there are, these apps are kids, we don't necessarily say to our kids, you must do this and explain everything, you must do this and pick class. Our students tend to choose the app that works best for them. And so even within our book, we will suggest an app, but there are many, many other apps that kids can use. Um, to document and share their learning. And so here you'll notice there's some overlap in what can be done and explain everything and what can be done in Book Creator. Or if you're moving into something like iMovie or some of the innate apps that are built, the native apps with the iPads, they come with, they all go back to back to back. Um, they work with each other and together. And so, I mean, there's that term app smashing and you, you saw a couple of examples where the kids have done some work in one app and put it into another app to combine to share their learning. And so it's not so much about saying you must use this app to do this job. It's about exposing your kids. If you expose your kids to these five main apps, they will be able to show most of what they're doing in ways that work best for them. Um, and so it, 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 it's cool to have those different features available in the different apps. OK, um, Karen and I wanted to share that we do have um, a book out, Innovate with iPad. Um, and all the lessons that you saw today are in the book. Um, and we also have a website. So when you, if you purchase the book, um, there's task cards that you can download from um, many of these lessons that you can uh, print out. And it's perfect for, for a center. And also, we also have student examples. So you'll see those videos. Um, so you'll, you can look at the lesson, and then um, there might be a student example that you can look at or share with your class. Um, so we wanted to show just what a layout page in our book is. We've really tried our best to make our book kind of work like a cookbook. Um, and so you can come in on the left-hand side, the grade level, the subject areas, um, if it's a beginner iPad, the beginner comfort level, or more advanced. And we typically, if it's just one app, we keep it more at the beginner level. And if we're starting to mix apps, we will say that it's more of an advanced level. The suggested apps, and again, you can change those suggested apps because it's not really about the app as much as about the showing of learning. Um, if there's a special tip we can show you, um, if we know something, um, and then there's a lesson extensions, and again, as Christian mentioned, there's task cards that you can download, and there'll be a little icon that'll take you to the website where you can download them, or there'll be an icon that'll take you to the website for examples. Uh, this is an example of one of the task cards. So you saw this example right at the beginning of the presentation, um, and so you can see we try and have a learning goal and what the students um, we want the students to, to learn in this activity. And then in the I can, we, we have the steps of exactly um, what to do in the app. And so this is great for um, printing it out, throwing it in like a, I use the dollar buckets from the dollar store in one iPad, and then it becomes a math station. Um, and going back to our website, one of our goals, and we haven't supported it well enough yet, but, but it's definitely in our, in our mission and hopefully you guys can start helping us, is with, right on the website there's some Google Slides where you're able to upload samples of your own work. We, 
we don't want this book to be a one-shot deal, you know, you bought it, you used it, you're done. We want to actually to keep it living. And, by, and one of the ways we want to do that is by collecting the ideas of things that you're doing. And so on the website, there's actually five, four or five different slide decks that you can, under the tab that says Let's Share, where you can upload your examples and say what you've done with the book with the hopes that we'll continue to inspire one another um, in, in our learning and our, in our growth in terms of having iPad and what's possible with learning with iPad. So this is our final slide. Um, just prior to questions, just to let you know who we are, we do want to leave some time for questions because we often get quite a few questions with people. Um, so just that I'm Karen and Kristen is here. You can always find us on Twitter. Our class, um, our iPad website is very simple, www.innovatewithipad.com. Our book is available both through EdTech Team Press as well as on Amazon, both the Canadian store, the American store, and some of the other stores internationally. We often get asked about a digital book, and we are working on a digital book. We're just trying to keep the integrity of the book. Um, the colors, the layout, the format, and that's, we're just struggling with that at the moment, but it's definitely something we're working on. We know there's a strong need for it, and um, it is coming, we promise. So with that, our final slide is questions, and I know that that's going to go to a live slide is questions, and we would love to answer your questions. Um, we have left some time so that we're able to do that. Great. Thank you so much, Karen and Kristen. Uh, the most recent question was, how do you teach kids to manage their devices and files for efficient storage? Is that question? Want me to? Yeah, go ahead, Karen. Okay. Well, one of the things for us, um, I am really fortunate my kids, as I've mentioned, have both blogs as well as um, digital portfolios that are used as tools for assessment. And so my, once my kids are able to share their work, complete and share their work, it doesn't need to stay on our iPads anymore. So if we've uploaded it to our kid blog or we've put it into um, our, our freshman portfolio, we no longer need that information. Another thing that I've done on, on the more shared devices that is I had, I know there's many people that have Google Classroom. I don't have Google Classroom, but we had Dropbox. And so I was able to set up folders for each of my kids on Dropbox where they could, anything in a camera roll, we could upload into a Dropbox folder. And then once we've done that, we can get it off of our devices. Um, so that was really that was a, a really easy way for us to share space, and it's and it's cutting down when you don't have that many apps on your iPad, you don't need near as much space, um, a storage space. And I think a lot of people download so many apps that their iPad is filled with apps, and there's nowhere to actually store your content creation. How and why do you see your student blogs as still important to use alongside another digital portfolio site or space? Ah, uh, great question. And I know this one's directed at me. I get it all the time. Um, I have two. Our digital portfolios are actually very assessment driven. Um, my assessment feedback is on there. The kids' assessment feedback. And I always think of like that report card that you get from your teacher. We typically don't share that publicly on an open space. Um, and so our portfolios have all our curriculum in them. They're all, all the BC curriculum is within that. And so those assessment pieces really aren't public. The work we create is public, and possibly some of our self-reflection pieces are public, but we're not necessarily sharing um, that this was not yet meeting expectations because of this, this, and this. So those are, those are really private conversations between the student, the parent, and I. And all three of us are very strongly involved in those portfolios, and there's private work that's put out there, and, it, and there are things we do that are kept private. Um, and, I, and I do believe, yet at the same time, in, in the tool that we use, I do have a blog so that we can go public with all of our work, and we can add our assessment pieces and those kind of things, but not what I'm actually, um, the goal that we set within the, the three of us involved with that child's learning, if that makes any sense. And so we still use KidBlock, tons of our work is up in KidBlock. Some of our work is up in two places, but for different purposes. Do you use Apple Server to push the apps in all of the devices? I don't manage my iPad. It's done beyond me, so I'm not sure what they use. I, I, I as well, I don't manage them. So um, if I want something on my iPads, then I have to put, it's kind of like a work order mm -hmm. to ask for the app on the iPad. Okay, now back to the questions that I had earlier. Um, the very first video that we saw, was that an example 
using draw and tell? Yes, it was. was. 13. Yes, it was, uh, it was using draw and tell. Okay. Can you tell us more about how you manage inquiry as an approach in your classroom? Another question. Um, we have had a large, a huge journey with inquiry. Um, we started with Genius Hour and um, it kind of flopped because I was kind of letting all the kids do whatever they wanted and learn whatever they wanted and being primary students that can't read very well and um, I was finding that there was not a lot of learning going on. So um, Book Creator really helped with that because we started actually with uh, sticky note projects. And so um, we would limit it to, we started with um, choosing an animal. So the kids could choose any animal and I had certain things that needed to be covered. Um, so they had to, you know, they could use certain sites. They had to use um, a couple books from the library. So it wasn't all digital. And then they had to have everything written down first. And then they could transfer that um, in creative ways onto the iPad. And that's kind of how we started our inquiry. It was a very model, modeled approach. And then they got to know the app and get to know um, how to use them and how to use Book Creator. And now um, they use green screen. They use um, many different apps to show their learning. and but they do use Book Creator a lot to show their inquiries. No matter what it is, it might be um, curriculum-based inquiry or it might be something that's, that's personal that they want to learn about. Um, and But it's, they really love using Book Creator just because you can add those videos and you can, any app that you can save to the, um, the camera roll or the photos, you can put into Book Creator. So we, we find that that's a great place to keep all their work. How long yeah, has it, I'm sorry. Well, let you finish. Um, how long does it take to introduce each of these apps to your students initially? Do you introduce them as a whole class or in some other way? Can um, you do that one? Yeah, yeah, I can do that one. Um, it really depends on the app, and it and it's interesting. The the key ones, I will typically introduce one app at a time, and I'll give them some kind of task. And, it, and I always say it's like the training. It's that beginning of the school year training where you're you know, getting them to put their things where they belong. And, and so I'll show them an app and I'll say, you know, I think the app can do this and I think the app can do this. And then under this button, it, it looks like it does. And I let them go. And then they'll start discovering things. And then when they discover, they get all excited. And then I go, oh, did anyone notice so-and-so found this? And, and then they start sharing with each other. But I find as, as and that's sort of for the beginning key apps, I get them to play and I get them to try. Um, and I might give them a task, and I want you to try to do this, but I want you to add voice, and I want, and then they play and, and they create. What what happens also though is I will my my stronger learners I will sort of pull them over and say you know I've got an app you might want to see, and I'll show just a couple of kids, and they'll start using it, and other kids will start asking them, and then soon enough I don't have to teach it; they're teaching each other, or the kids will notice something that's on the iPad, and they'll just get in and they'll start trying to figure out how it works and what it's doing. I also so really find oh, I'm sorry, Karen. Yeah, no um, I also find that doing one app and making sure that those um, children are comfortable with it and know it, it's almost at the beginning of the year, I, we use one app until they're, they're almost begging for something else <laughs> just because it's, um, we call it app fluency. So if you have many apps on the iPad and you don't, the kids have to think about how to use that app, then it's taking away from the learning. They're using their, you know, they're using their time to try and figure out the app. So I try and have my students know the app very well until and use it. And when I feel that, you know, if they're fluent in it, then we move on to to another app. Great. That addressed more than one version of that question. Um, do you recommend creating templates to help the kids get jump started or does that interfere with creativity? Um, I, did, I did answer a bit of that in the chat. I find mm -hmm. that um, I do sometimes use templates to um, in explain everything. I'll create some, a project and I'll um, use AirDrop to drop it to the iPads and I'll have certain things that they need to do on each page. And I'll do that more at the beginning of the year when we're just learning the app. 
and it gives them multiple ways of how to use that, and then they can take those ways that they've learned and do it on their own the next time. Okay, I think those were the questions I was able to capture. Does anyone else have any questions for Karen and Kristen? I and we're always people typing on Twitter. Mm -hmm. How do you ensure students use the devices safely? It looks like. Um, and it's funny we that that using devices safely that goes for any tool we have in our classroom. Mm -hmm. um, like in terms of actual handling of devices, but we do have that online safety talk, and we talk about what would you put online and what you wouldn't. Um, but using an iPad isn't it doesn't mean that things are going online. But it but it's the same conversation you would have with the felt markers you have in your classroom or the pencils that you have in your classroom and how you treat each other, treating with respect, being kind, being safe. Those aren't, it doesn't, because it's iPad, the same expectations occur whether it's with an iPad or, or whether it's with a pencil. Sure. Um, lots of great digital citizenship information like people are sharing um, for our students and making them aware. I mean, and I think as early as teachers, it's our responsibility to get that knowledge into their heads. And, and often I'm educating the parents along the way, mm -hmm. um, which is always interesting too, because people don't know because it's still quite new. But hopefully it will be the norm that those questions don't even need to be asked. That's the goal. Yeah. Great. Um, th again, thank you for presenting today. I'm going to turn the mic over to Peggy, who will introduce our next topics. Thank you so much, Karen and Kristen. We are all so inspired to go out there now and try some of these great new ideas, even if we were familiar with the apps. We now know how have better ideas about things we can actually do with them. So thank you. Next week, October 8th, we have a real treat for you. We have not had Steve Hargadon on our show for a very long time. And he is our Classroom 2 mentor, inspiration, and support person. And he's going to come next week and share a lot of things about himself. If you haven't met him, you're not going to want to miss this. He is going to kind of take us through a journey on his life as an educator, and we're calling it Confessions of a Learning Revolutionary. You're going to love it, so be sure to join us next Saturday. The following Saturday, we have an awesome featured teacher. Shelly Fryer is going to be joining us, and she's doing some amazing things with her students, and we can't wait to have her share them with all of us. October 22nd, we will not have a show because we all want to go to the Discovery Education Fall Virtual Conference. And then on October 29th, we have a great new rubric for teachers called Orange Slice that Matt Buchanan is going to share with us. So there's the link, and it's also in our live binder for the Fall Virtual Conference. Be sure to register for that. It's free, but you want to be able to get all the links for, the, for joining the presentations. So we'll look forward to having you join us every Saturday that you can. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar. So you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session like this one. And as long as your session is public, it's free. As you exit the session, the survey should open up. You can also take the survey link from chat either in the chat box or in the log, or it's in the live binder. At the end of the survey, you can request a professional development certificate. And it now prints out with your name, thanks to Patty Ruffing. And she sends these out. Please, though, request this to be sent to a personal email address. Schools tend to block them from getting to you. Special thanks to 
Karen Leardman and Kristen Wybeam, the Steve Harkadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for a webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today, thanks so much for coming.